Welcome back to the Flying Monk talk show. I'm your host, Alex Cosma. In today's episode, we have a very special video interview and action footage with the renowned Hong Kong stuntman and Kung Fu movie actor, Mark Houghton. Before we get into the interview, I want to say a big thank you to each and every one of you who tunes in to our Flying Monk YouTube channel. And thank you for making it more and more popular as the weeks and months go on. And please tune in also to lineofintent.com, where you will find all of our books and documentary films, instructional videos about the traditional martial arts, such as Bagua, Xing Yi, Tai Chi Chuan, and Buddhism, Taoism, traditional medicine. That is the lineofintent.com. If you are interested in the traditional arts, you will find a lot of interesting subject matter there. Thank you, all of you, for tuning into this channel. And to get back to today's topic, I heard about Sifu Mark Houghton for many decades. I had heard from various friends in Asia and Hong Kong that he was a person who could really use Hongar and the traditional martial arts to fight for real. And of course, all of us who practice traditional martial arts know that there is often a big gap between the practice of the tradition and real fighting. Mark Houghton is somebody who has put his life on the line for decades and has been involved in many life or death fights. And he has survived. He has survived. And also he has become very famous in the Hong Kong film industry as the one non-Chinese person to really make it as a stuntman and action movie star. He talks a lot about his experiences in the coming interview the first part of which you will see in a moment. I want to thank Mark Houghton very much and his daughter Charlene Houghton who appears in some of the action sequences which I filmed in Birmingham a couple of weeks ago and thank you to both Mark and Charlene Houghton for being so generous with their time and also allowing me to film the seminars. If you have any interest in traditional hangar Kung Fu, then please check out the link at the bottom of this video to see when Mark Houghton is next in the UK or maybe also a country where you are. He is teaching all over the world and keeping alive the legacy of his Sifu, Lao Galiang. And of course, Sifu Lao Galiang, Grandmaster of Hangar Kung Fu, who passed away a few years ago, is famous for movies such as Mad Monkey Kung Fu, 36th Chamber of Shaolin, and also The Drunken Master 2. Mark Halton became the disciple of Lao Galiang, and Mark also got to make movies with most of the big names in Hong Kong, such as Jackie Chan, and also uh, Hong Kambo. So in the coming interview, you will hear a lot of stories about Sifu Mark Houghton's life. And in this first part, he begins by discussing how he started to practice martial arts as a child. You know, you see the Bruce Lee movies. I was doing judo, karate, taekwondo, which is Japanese and Korean arts. After watching the Bruce Lee movies, I really wanted to change the Chinese martial art. But I really couldn't find a teacher that was able to teach traditional Chinese martial arts. There was one or two about that were teaching which were actually, let's say, fake, or teaching something that they had no clue about, you know, um, just to jump on the Bruce Lee bandwagon and make money, you know. Um, and what I saw them doing just it just left a question mark in me. What 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 I wanted was something more. And um, I made a friends with a Malaysian Chinese and he actually tried to get me to go to Hong Kong and become a police officer. Because Hong Kong was British rule at that time. And it was easy for British citizens to get a job in the police force in Hong Kong. 
So at 17 years old, I actually applied to become a British, uh, to become a British uh, a police officer in Hong Kong. And they sent me a letter back accepting it. But they said that I needed to go to college and to get uh, a few more um, education. I need to get five A-levels. Because they said that as a British, as a, as a British person, I, they could only accept me to become an officer. I couldn't become a constable. No. Well, at that time, I wasn't strong in my studies, so I, I, I quit school at 16, I didn't go to college, and I didn't really want to study, I just wanted to learn martial arts. So in that case, my friend decided that you know, I might as well go to Malaysia and live with his family. They owned a hotel, they were well off. so. I ended up going to Malaysia and staying with them and they kind of adopted me as part of their family. And uh, I started learning White Crane Kung Fu because the, the White Crane Kung Fu school was just opposite uh, the hotel that they owned. So it wasn't far to travel. And they even paid for me to learn. Um, <clears throat> but it's still, it was great. When I first started learning the White Crane, it was great because it was in a group and they were doing all the movements together and it looked like something out of a Kung Fu movie, you know. So I was quite happy with that, but then something was missing, you know. Um, it was the attitude of the, 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 the Sifus, you know, there was no relationship. Uh, you wasn't an indoor disciple, you were just a student, you just come there, pay the money do two hours training and leave and come back three times a week. And it didn't, it just didn't keep me there. I wanted something, I wanted something different. I was looking for something that more insight that could give me more. And a friend of mine, and he was funny because he was a cook at the hotel, but his name was Lei Shulong, Bruce Lee, in, in Chinese, you know. So he introduced me to this old guy that did Hong Ga Kung Fu. And uh, he was a very skinny guy. He was in his 50s when I first met him and I was only in my late teens. But he was skinnier than me. And uh, he looked frail. And when I first saw him, I didn't believe that he was a Kung Fu master. And plus, he didn't like me. When he first saw me, we met in a restaurant and he was drinking Guinness. And he looked at me and he said, you want to learn Chinese martial arts? I said, yeah, he says, you can't. Chinese martial arts for Chinese. If you want to learn, you go back to England, you learn boxing. Boxing is for Westerners. And I looked at him and said, well, it's actually attitude, that's fine, but I'm not leaving here till I learn Chinese martial arts. And I went to leave, he said, yeah, but you're English. And I said, yeah, he goes, English can drink beer. And I said, yeah, he said, well, drink with me. So we sat there and got drunk all night. And then the next, uh, the next day, my friend Bruce Lee come to look for me. Not the Bruce Lee, but my friend's name is the same name. And uh, he comes up to me and says, oh, we're going to the master's house. And, and I was like, why? He doesn't want to teach and I, I don't think he's that good. He's so skinny. He goes, no, no, you've got to go. So he took me to his house. And when we went in, he, he said again, he said, he doesn't think as a Westerner I could learn Chinese martial art. He says, but you'll give me a chance. He said, you'll give me seven days. And if I return after seven days, he would teach me for free. So I said, okay. So we started with the horse dance. So I, I got into horse dance and he picked up a, a cane. And every time I stood up, he hit me with it. And he hit me so hard that it left welts in my legs. And what he was trying to do was frighten me away. So if I stood up, it hit me. If I fell down, it hit me. And I ended up with like 12 welts on each side, of the, on each leg, you know. And it was really, really painful, but I just was so stubborn, I, I just kept going. After that, he pulled out a, a bamboo log. And the bamboo log was like this, this wide, this in circumference. And he'd hollowed it out and he filled it with lead shot. So it was very heavy and he hung it up. And we used this to do a cue sao. So Hong Ga is very famous for their horse dance, their cue sao, and then their fist techniques. 
right? So these three had to be hardened. So then after my legs had given up and I couldn't do any more stunts, we went on to the, the q cell training. So I'd hit this log one, two, three. And after a while, my hands were shaking. They were all black and bruised and I couldn't close my hands. <clears throat> and if I stopped, he'd hit me again with the stick. So he did everything he could to persuade me not to come back. The next day I came back, the next day I came back. Soon the seven days were up and I came back and I looked at him and said, well, you've got to teach me for free now. So he accepted me as his disciple. And I stayed there for nearly three years. Was he skilled? He was very skilled. I mean, the thing is, after, after that, he demonstrated Tiger and Crane for me. And once I started to watch him move, my faces were... When he finished, I was still like that. You know, it was just, it was unbelievable. I couldn't believe someone his size was so fast, strong and powerful. You know, and his Q cell was so hard and his tiger claw as well. He spent many hours just using chopsticks and he'd just grind the chopsticks like this. And he took a sugar cane and he grabbed the sugar cane and squeezed it and the water came out. No. He'd take a can of carnation milk and use a phoenix eye and break it, open it. No. And he also did iron palm, iron fist, so he could take coconut and break the coconut. So he showed me this and I was like, wow. share the class it was free of charge and after training then he would take me drinking and he would pay you know so you know it was just a, an unbelievable experience with him and I was lucky because he was he was an uneducated person he left school at 13 years of age and started work as a carpenter and he worked as a carpenter until the day he died you know um, so he was uneducated but his, his martial arts was unbelievable. He had a computer, he had a martial art computer brain. So he used to watch people perform and then he'd go away and do the whole form on just watching one time. You know, he was, he was amazing, unbelievable. What was his lineage from, different <clears throat> from Master Lao's lineage? Okay, um, yeah, when I first learned from him, he was telling me, oh, this is Hong Ga. Uh, but the funny thing is, it, the only things they have in common with the Hong Kong lineage is the tiger and crane. Uh, and the uh, fifth brother, the fifth brother, Paul, you know. Uh, all the rest of the forms were different. You know? But his excuse for it was, they come from a different lineage. Because the lineage that, that Hong Kong comes from is uh, Hong Hei Kuan, Lok Ah Choi, Wong Ke Ying, Wong Fei Hong, Lam Sai Wing. Then for me it's Lao Zhao, Lao Ga Liang, then me. And other people from Lam Sai Wing would go to Dan Fong, um, or go for Chan Wan Chung, or go to uh, Lam Zhou. And then they would come down in their lineages. But all the Hong Kong people are the same, they had in common, so they all came to Lam Sai Wing which is Wang Fei Hong's top student, you see. And then from there they spread out. So they had the same forms, had the same movement. But the Malaysia was so different, so they said that theirs come from uh, Hong Hei Kuan on a different lineage. They didn't go through Lok Ah Choi or anybody else. Which at that time made sense. That's why it was different. But after I left and I come back to the UK, I opened a school here. <coughs> I started teaching in Coventry at first and I just rented some places to teach. Then I come to Birmingham and started renting a church hall here and there. But then eventually I managed to get um, 
a room above the snooker hall in the majestic snooker hall in New Street Station. So I, I was the first one to open a first time full time on guard school, you know, um, and we had it all set out with weapons and bags and everything. And I ran it for about a year. And at the same time with that, I was doing what most martial art instructors do. They work on doors, uh, they do some bodyguard work and that. So I was doing this. And then um, I got to work as a bodyguard for this Hong Kong Chinese guy who was a businessman. <coughs> so he asked me to teach his children. So I was teaching his children. And then, um, you know, we, he had some restaurants. We went to his restaurants for a meal. And, we were getting drunk and talking and his response was, yeah, you, I know why you like Kung Fu because of Bruce Lee and like everybody else. And I says, well, you know, Bruce Lee was the one that opened the doors and let me know there was something other than Japanese or Korean martial arts. But I said, you know, to me, my hero is not Bruce, my hero is La Gala. You know? His movies are unbelievable. He uses real kung fu. Um, his kung fu is just out of the world, out of this world. I haven't seen anybody else match what he does. <coughs> and he says, "Well, that's funny because his friend in Hong Kong is a very good friend of Lao Gao." So my eyes widened, and I said, "Well, would there be a chance of arranging a meeting?" I said, "Well, you know, maybe I can fly to Hong Kong, meet him." take a photo and put it in my school and that was it, that was my thinking. And then I'd come back and teach and then I'd have his photo there. And I was quite happy with that. So he arranged for that to happen and I, I flew to Hong Kong. And I met a few people, I met Quan Tai Hing, who always played the, 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 the Wang Fei Hong black and white movies. You now he's a very famous martial artist, he traveled around the world doing demonstrations. And I, and I met a few other people and that. And then the main meeting came for me to meet my hero, Lao Galang. And he was working in Cinema City at the time. And he just finished a film called uh, Tiger on the Beat. And um, he w that was with uh, Conan Lee and Ch uh, Chow Yun Fat. And he's just starting a new movie called Aces Go Places Part Five with Mark Gard and Sam Wei. And he go and he, we went in and I said hello to him. And I spoke a bit of Mandarin because in Malaysia I learned a little bit of Mandarin, but I couldn't speak Cantonese. And I found out that he's, he doesn't speak Mandarin. So I tried to speak a little bit of Mandarin to him, but then I had other people translate for me from English to Cantonese. And I told him that he's my hero. And that I watched one of his films and then I decided I wanted to do Honga. So he smiled and asked me to perform for him. So I performed some Tiger and Crane for him. <clears throat> and he was quite impressed. He said, my horse stance was very low. Um, I had a good horse stance. And he doesn't see many people train horse stance like that anymore. And then he stood up and left the room. And he was gone for like five minutes. And it was kind of awkward just sitting there. Nothing. And then he came back, stood his head through the window and asked, am I not following him? And then the people said he wants you to go with him and he took me for dinner. So we went to a restaurant for dinner and then what would happen dinner he said that he was just getting ready to film another film as a place for five. And he said he might have a part for me would I be interested in it. So of course you know my hero and a part in his movie I was like yeah sure I would love to of course. So that was in June or July but the film wasn't starting till November. So I come back to the UK and then uh, October time I flew back to Hong Kong. So the, the film was delayed a little bit till December. So uh, one of the stuntmen introduced me to Philip Cole, Cole Fay. And I did a movie for him first. So I did a movie called uh, Sa Sao Tensi, which is Angel Killers with Moon Lee. Lei Chui Fong. And that was the first movie I did. So at the end, it's funny because that movie um, consisted of uh, Gordon Liu, Lao Ga Fei, and Lao Ga Yang, uh, Long. Um, people call him Beardy. And he was in that movie as well. So I was in the end fighting Lei Chui Fong. So it was a really good experience 
doing that before I got to work with Sifu in his movies. So then um, we started late November, early December, as he's got places. And I, I remember on, when I first got on set, it was a night shoot and we're in a shipping container yard. And they were filming and he stopped filming and asked me to perform in front of everybody. And when I looked, he was performing with me. So I was like, I gotta be better than him, song. But I couldn't never be faster. When every time to go fast, he was so far ahead of me. I just couldn't keep up with him. He was, he was even more amazing in real life than he was on film, you know. So I was in my element, you know. It, Cloud nine in a dream, not and you have to pinch yourself to see if you're awake or not, you know. So it was just the, the experience itself was just amazing. And still, you know, in my mind, it was like this one experience, and then go back and teach martial arts and have some pictures of him and pictures on the film set would be great for my school, you know. The flower is this way, the leather is this way. So when the leather But near the end of the movie, he turned to me and we were sitting there and he says, well, what are you doing after this? You really want to go back to the UK or you want to stay here and work for me? And I was like, close the school, I'm never coming back. And that was it, you know. And, but still, a relationship, I was more of an action actor, stuntman hired by him rather than his student, you know. It wasn't until we filmed Drunken Master 2 that I actually got a chance to do the bison, become his real disciple, you know, which again was just uh, amazing. I mean, you see this guy on film, he's your hero, and you can never dream that one day, not only meeting him, that you become his disciple and follow him in the movie industry, to become a stuntman, action actor, action director, you know, and also learn his martial arts to be able to pass on to the next generation. It's just something that I never ever imagined I'd do. And learning martial arts from the beginning, I never thought I'd become an actor or an action director or anything like that. You know, I just thought you know, I'd be one of these guys that learns something and have a little school somewhere and teach. But you know, I always asked him as well, I said, you know, to me, your martial arts are the best in the world. People watch your films and then they go and learn martial arts, you know. So it's funny that he, he didn't have a school, he didn't teach. But he said to me, he said, well, you know, I did. He actually started teaching at 13 years of age and he was teaching adults in Macau. But then at 16, he came back to Hong Kong to follow his father in the black and white Wong Fei Hong movies. So, Quan Da Hing was Wong Fei Hong. Now his father was a student of Lam Sai Wing, but in the black and white movies, he actually played his Sifu. So he played Lam Sai Wing in the black and white movies. And then he brought his son Lao Ga Liang in to be a stuntman. So he started to work as a stuntman in the, in the film industry at 16 years of age. And then he, that he stopped teaching. And then he, he took people from the movie industry and they became his students. Um, but he only taught them movie action, movie fighting. What, enough what they needed for that film. He never taught them traditional martial arts uh, in, the, in the sense of a complete system. No. So he, he's, he's got a lot of famous Hong Kong actors that he took as disciples, but he just teaches them the action they needed for the, the movies. For actual traditional martial arts, he only has four or five students. No. And it, it was a shame. I mean, to me, I, I expected more. You know. And he said to me, he says, Mike, he said, if I am in the school, he says, how am I going to charge? He says, as a movie star, as a director, you know how much movie I make for one movie? It's in the millions. Now, if I open a Kung Fu school and I charge what I'm worth in the movie industry, no one's going to be able to pay it. 
Now, if I own a Kung Fu school and I charge the same rate as other Kung Fu masters charge, then I got no face. And then he said, if I open a school, how many people can I teach? 50 people? 100 people? But if I promote my Kung Fu in movies, how many people can I influence to learn martial arts? Or Chinese martial arts? Millions. And that's what he did. He used the movie industry to promote and teach his martial art. And, you know, I met people, well, I've not met them, but people have contacted me and told me that, you know, they teach Hong Kong and they learn from my master. I was like, you did? He said, yeah, we watched his films, we learned everything from his films. So even though they didn't meet him personally, and even though they didn't learn from him personally, his films influenced them. And his, his, his martial arts in film are real. So, you know, they copy this movement. They might not be able to understand behind the movements or adapt them to make them real or make them work, but they learned the movement. And they started teaching and opening schools. And then other people watched these movies and went to learn from different masters, different styles. But it doesn't matter whether they learn Hong Kong or learn Bat Mei or, or Tai Chi or whatever, you know. His films influenced them. His films are the ones that made them go and look for their masters. So, you know, it's just amazing that the effect he had between him and Bruce, they've got to be the two most influential people that opened up the world to Chinese martial arts. I mean, I would say Bruce would be the first one. Um, everybody would know Bruce first. But I don't see Bruce as a traditional martial artist. He learned a little bit of Tai Chi from his father. He learned some Wing Chun. But he didn't learn the whole system. And he mostly learned his Wing Chun from Wang Chong Leung, not Yip Man. You know? And then he didn't learn the whole system. When he went to America, he couldn't use the Wing Chun to fight these big guys with long arm reach. He couldn't hit that. So he eventually had to adapt and change and he developed his own Jeet Kune Do where he gave away to forms, he gave away to tradition. He just wanted something simple and effective. And you know, he made something that was very effective. He, he invented Jeet Kune Do. He has many, many famous students under him that have become masters in their own right. So to me, Bruce is one of the most influential people of showing people what was Chinese martial art. But then again, he destroyed the traditional arts to make his martial art. So she works on this one. She's going to go to the eye, down the ear. Now, I can turn back and do this, you know, 